What a thrilling life awaits you. The acquisition of knowledge is a sacred activity. A truly educated man never ceases to learn. The future is in your hands. The outcome is up to you. This BYU devotional address with Dallin Moody was given on March 6, 2012. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our campus devotional where Brother Dallin R. Moody will be our speaker. We welcome his wife, April, who is seated on the stand, as well as their family and friends who have joined with us. Originally from Kennewick, Washington, he received a bachelor's degree in statistics with a minor in mathematics from BYU. He later earned an MBA from Utah State University. Following his graduation from BYU, Brother Moody worked as a with a technology company and then spent six years working for the LDS Church Audit Department. While working for the Church, he passed the Certified Internal Auditor exam and performed audits in various places throughout the world. Dallin joined BYU Athletics in 2008 as the Associate Athletic Director over Finances, merging two of his great passions, numbers and sports. He is primarily responsible for overseeing the day-to-day -day financial operations of the athletic department, including scholarships, accounts payable, and budgets. Brother Moody served a full-time mission to London, England. He has served as a bishop in Orem and currently serves on the audit committee of his stake and of the high priest group leadership in his ward. He and his wife, April, are the parents of four boys, aged 5 through 12, who are all enthusiastic BYU fans. And now we'll be privileged to hear from Brother Dallin Moody. As a brand new missionary in England, I was assigned to the southern coast for my first area. One Sunday afternoon, my companion and I decided to go tracting in the small town of Sandwich, located just a few miles north of the White Cliffs of Dover. After a few hours knocking on doors, feeling like we must have talked to every living person in the place and without any success at all, we sat dejectedly down on a nearby bench. Although it was summertime, as sometimes happens in England, it was a rather cold and damp day. Feeling downcast due to the lack of response in our efforts to share the gospel, my companion tried to lighten the mood by remarking, it's okay, Elder, it could be worse. It could be one degree colder right now. His comment was well received and hit home. Life really wasn't bad. We were in a beautiful country. We had the gospel. We were missionaries on the Lord's errand. In fact, I had more blessings than problems. I felt much better knocking on doors the rest of the afternoon, armed with an enlightened attitude and a pure perspective, although I was still damp, still cold, and still wish someone would listen. As insightful and perceptive as was my companion's point that it could be worse, it could be one degree colder, what happens when it does get one degree colder? Or for that matter, what happens when, metaphorically speaking, it gets 10 or even 50 degrees colder? What happens when the pressure is on, the crowd is watching, and the game is on the line? In a college environment, what do you do when the homework is grueling, the exams are punishing, the roommates are exasperating, and that long for eternal companion is not materializing? <laughs> or after college, what do you do if you don't land a job, if you get laid off, you have stress in your marriage, you have poor health, or your teenagers don't listen? In those times of trial, despair, fear, and worry, I say that is the time when the stage is best set for God to show forth His power. Indeed, it is often in the most dire of circumstances that God's arm is revealed most miraculously. Miracles require faith and generally some amount of courage and hope on our part, as well as trust that God will always do His part. We must also remember that God's ways are not our ways. His response to a given situation might be different than what we want to have happen. In addition, the timing of his response could vary greatly from our expectation of timing. Yet in all cases, God's involvement in our lives is carefully crafted to bring about the greatest good. For he doeth not anything save it be for the benefit of the world. Several years ago, I gave a lesson in my elders quorum based on the first presidency message in the July 2004 Ensign written by President Thomas S. Monson entitled Miracles of Faith. One part of that lesson particularly struck me because of the uniqueness of a principle that I had not previously considered. 
which afterwards became even more personally poignant because of the imminent events that were about to occur in our home. From time to time, the Lord puts certain truths into our hearts that affect our future destiny. We may not fully understand his reason for teaching us these principles at these particular times. Instead, it is often once we have passed through the ensuing experiences that clarity comes. We can then look back through life's lenses and more fully see that God does prepare a way for us to accomplish what he commandeth. Part of President Monson's message that I shared with my elders quorum read, mothers and fathers who anxiously await the arrival of a precious child sometimes learn that all is not well with this tiny infant. A missing limb, sightless eyes, a damaged brain greets the parents, leaving them baffled, filled with sorrow and reaching out for hope. There follows the inevitable blaming of oneself the condemnation of a careless action, and the perennial questions. Why such a tragedy in our lives? Why, how did this happen? Where was God? Where was a protecting angel? If, why, where, how? Those recurring words do not bring back the lost son, the perfect body, the plans of parents, or the dreams of youth. Self-pity, personal withdrawal, or deep despair will not bring the peace, the assurance, or help which are needed. Rather, we must go forward, look upward, move onward, and rise heavenward. It is imperative that we recognize that whatever has happened to us has happened to others. They have coped, and so must we. We are not alone. Heavenly Father's help is near. What struck me was that the absence of the miracle could actually be a miracle in and of itself. The premise being that as God's ways and thoughts are higher than man's, at times the Lord may choose to provide a miracle counterintuitive to what we may want, knowing full well his end purpose. And because of the absence of the miracle fixed in our minds, he's better able to help us grow and thus become happier than we ever could have been had we received the desired miracle for which we had prayed. At the time, I naively thought that my impression of that principle was because I had given a blessing to the daughter of a family I home taught, hoping that a dramatic recovery would spark the family back into activity. When the little girl ended up in the hospital that same day, I thought, well, the absence of the miracle would somehow bless their life more than, she, more than if she had been miraculously healed. However, little did I suspect then the extraordinary experience amongst the challenges that the Lord was already engineering. About a month later, we went to an ultrasound appointment to see whether my expectant wife, April, was having a boy or a girl. We learned that we were having our third son, we also learned that there were severe physical complications afflicting his body. He was missing large portions of his brain, his skull wasn't properly shaped, and the doctors weren't even sure if he would survive till delivery. During the ensuing weeks, it seemed that every time we received additional information, it was bad news. I still remember sitting in the Brewster building just across from the Wilkinson Center when my wife called to tell me the latest update, that our son wouldn't have a right eye. Thinking back to my mission companion, it certainly felt like it was worse than one degree colder. With faith, and in order to pray more specifically and effectively for our unborn son, we decided on his name early. Normally, we waited until they arrived so we could actually see that our children look, to see what our children looked like to make sure they matched their names. In this case, we chose the name of Caleb, after the Old Testament Israelite, who was a companion to Moses and Joshua, and was noted for his fearlessness in the face of overwhelming odds. Caleb survived his birth, though it quickly became apparent that he would be very much like a newborn baby throughout his entire life. He would never walk, he would never talk, he would never feed himself, or be able to so much as hold his head up on his own. When asked how long we might expect him to live, the doctor replied, just take him home and never bring him back to the hospital. We can't do anything more for him. You have a few weeks to a few months, outside chance of a year, possibly two. I remember being terrified as we walked out of the hospital with our little boy to take him home. The number of machines and medical equipment we needed to sustain his life was overwhelming. The possibility of losing him was a constant fear. Simply feeding him required an extraordinary effort as he needed to eat every three hours. The process to eat took one hour to complete. This involved waking up all throughout the night. Start the pump, sleep for an hour, stop the pump, sleep for two hours, start the pump again, sleep for another hour, and so on. We wondered how we'd keep ourselves alive, let alone our fragile son. 
Thankfully, the Lord blessed us with many miracles in what might have looked like a hopeless situation. Angels in the form of ward members, family, friends, and medical personnel came to our aid. We literally had meals brought in for three months. We had a competent and caring nurse, a doctor who made house calls, and family and neighbors that prayed mightily in our behalf. We could feel heaven's hand upon us. I felt angels walked our hallways and sat in Caleb's room. Our three-year-old son sometimes told us that he saw Jesus peeking in our windows. In Caleb's baby blessing, I promised him that he had completed his task on earth by being born and that he could now rest for a time. But this wasn't the plan for Caleb and his mother. In some kind of pact with heaven that I have yet to fully understand, Caleb and April bargained with heaven to do a greater work. God had matched them up perfectly. Caleb with his fearlessness in the face of overwhelming odds and April with her mother's love and daring optimism. April purposefully chose hope and trust in the Lord. To her core, she is happy and optimistic. With God's help, she took what could have been a terrifying trial and reshaped it. She took a corner of heaven and pulled it right down into our home and opened it up for all to enjoy. Every day became a celebration with Caleb. She made him a birthday cake after his first week, cookies after his second, and cupcakes for his third week, and so on. She celebrated everything about Caleb, for every day was truly a once-in-a-lifetime experience for the boy who was sent home without hope. In what might have looked like a burdensome task to others, caring for Caleb became a privilege. Though his body was misshapen and broken, his spirit was whole, noble, and great. Being in his presence was healing and heavenly. I love my wife and thank her, Caleb, and Heavenly Father for making the time with Caleb not only possible, but powerful. It was indeed heaven on earth. Even missing his eye was a blessing. It became his distinctive feature. People were drawn to him, especially children. They would often ask, where is his eye? What happened to him? I would usually say something about Caleb being a pirate or that a bear had eaten his eye. But my wife would explain that in our family, a wink meant, I love you. Before Caleb was born, we told our boys that he would only have one of his eyes. Of course, they were concerned for their brother. Don't worry, she would say. He will just wink at us every day. Caleb was never able to tell us that he loves us with words, but every day he told us with his wink. His little wink was a daily message of love from heaven. He brought the love of God and the light of Christ into the lives of all who knew him. His winking eye was a sweet reminder of his deep love for all of us. Hope and courage have always characterized the righteous. Ever the optimist, Joseph Smith, was once quoted as saying, I should never get discouraged whatever difficulties should surround me. If I was sunk in the lowest pit of Nova Scotia and all the Rocky Mountains piled on top of me, I ought not to be discouraged, but hang on, exercise faith, and keep up good courage, and I should come out on the top of the heap. It was this type of faithful fortitude that saved the Nephites from the decree of death declared by the unbelievers if the sign of Christ's birth did not come. But it came the very night that Nephi prayed. Likewise, a measure of firm faith and trust in God preceded the parting of the Red Sea, saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from a fiery furnace, and helped David defeat a giant. However, not all miracles deliver. Sometimes, according to God's purposes, miracles are seemingly withheld in order for his greater designs to develop. After all, Abinadi was burned at the stake, the Mormons were driven out of Jackson County, and Joseph Smith was martyred at Carthage Jail. Or on a less important scale, but still significant to those involved, lost puppies may not be found, testing center prayers may not be immediately answered, and church basketball games may not be played with good sportsmanship, in spite of prayers offered otherwise. But that doesn't mean that God is absent or that he doesn't care or hasn't provided a miracle. I say again that it is at those times when it is 10 degrees colder that God is involved. He does care and is performing his work. We must remember that as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his ways higher than our ways and his thoughts than our thoughts. Just imagine what would happen if miracles were left up to us. In my arena of athletics, it would probably go something like this. Because the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the true church, and BYU is sponsored by the true church, therefore it's the Lord's University, 
And because the BYU sports teams are flagships for the university, therefore it would make sense that no BYU team should ever lose. That would be obvious evidence that the church were true. What a blessing this would be to the growth of the church. I can imagine the discussions between a missionary and an investigator. Brother Jones, as you know, the BYU football team has never lost. The basketball team has won every national title, and all of their golfers get a hole-in-one on every stroke. <laughs> Don't you think it's about time you join the church? <laughs> Obviously, the Lord does not work this way. A plan where supposedly everything went right, and so nobody would be lost, was already proposed and rejected. The plan of salvation, on the other hand, allows for opposition in all things, sadness and sweetness, wrongdoing and repentance, trial and testimony. With so much opposition in our lives at times, it seems like God chooses to work through underdogs. Take Gideon of the Old Testament, for example. Israel was in bondage to the Midianites, so God called Gideon to deliver them, and he raised an army of 32,000 men. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand has saved me. God asked Gideon to reduce his army to 10,000, which was still too many. God then asked him to reduce his force even further, further, to just 300 men to go against a foe who were like grasshoppers for multitude, and their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. But with the help of God and against all odds, Gideon and those 300 men bested the Midianites and their tens of thousands. God is clear, clearly not limited by the same constraints that affect our mortal way. Left on their own, Gideon and his 300 would have had little chance for victory. Gideon was not alone, nor is he the only instance of God using small and simple means to bring about his great and eternal purposes. God took Enoch, a lad slow of speech, and walked with him. And so great was the faith of Enoch that he led the people of God, and he spake the word of the Lord, and the earth trembled, and the mountains fled, even according to his command. And the rivers of water were turned from out of their course, and all nations feared greatly. So powerful was the word of Enoch, and so great was the power of the language which God had given him. God also took former Egyptian slaves and molded them into the mighty Israelite nation. He turned a fisherman into a chief apostle, and he shaped a plowboy into a prophet. The Lord himself came in the most humble of circumstances, a babe in a manger, born in a carpenter's family, who would become Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and Savior of worlds without end. Such miraculous transformations come as a result of trust in God's plan. One night for family scripture study, we read the New Testament account of the man which is blind from his birth. This caused his disciples to ask him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Seeing the obvious parallel in our own home, our young sons asked why Caleb was born blind. In the next verse, the Lord provided our response. Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Then Jesus healed the man so that he could see. Caught up a bit in the grandeur of the story, our boys asked whether I could heal Caleb. I stammered some kind of response that I didn't feel it was the Lord's will for Caleb to be healed. I added that often the healings in, recorded in the scriptures were performed by Jesus, prophets and apostles, very righteous men commissioned by God to perform miracles for specific purposes of blessing the lives of those involved and increasing the faith of those who would eventually read these stories. Not to be put off and possibly sensing my apprehensive response, my boys faithfully concluded that it was time to appeal to a higher authority. It so happened that we were going to the church administration building later that week to attend the setting apart of my dad as a mission president by one of the brethren. Knowing that we would be meeting an apostle, my sons requested that I ask him to heal Caleb. Talk about being put between a rock and a hard place. How could I sustain their faith without selfishly imposing on an apostle? I compromised with my boys by telling them that I would not ask for a blessing on Caleb, but that we would leave it in the hands of the Lord. It was a wonderful occasion to be with my dad as he was set apart and to be in the presence of one of the Lord's special witnesses. He wasn't inspired to heal Caleb. As we walked out of his office, he stopped at Caleb's stroller and bent down and kissed him. He told him three times that he loved him. He then shook my hand, 
hugged my wife, and while whispering in her ear said, I am so proud of you. In the sight of God, Caleb did not need healing. Instead, it was me that left that office peacefully whole. Trusting in God means that we also trust in his timing. The man in the New Testament story was blind from birth. I'm not sure how old he was, but that miracle was years in the waiting. And then one day, the master came along and healed him. In his own time and in his own way, God will respond. As an example of the Lord's timing in my life, I had been in, at my new job in the BYU Athletic Department for about three weeks when I had to go down to Las Vegas for a business meeting as part of the conference basketball tournament. I woke up very early in the morning to make the long drive down to be in time for my 12 o'clock meeting. My wife and I had prayed fervently that I would make it safely. Caleb had been in the hospital for a few weeks, and we had been pulling many late nights to be with him. Despite every precaution and physical effort that I could make, just outside of St. George, I fell asleep in the blink of an eye while driving full speed down the freeway. I woke up to find myself heading down the hill into the median dividing the highway, one set of tires on the pavement and the other in the weeds and the gravel. I quickly spun the wheel to take me back on the road, but this only caused me to do a 180 degree turn across the lanes of traffic. Thankfully, there were no other cars near me. And once I got to the far right hand side of the, the road, I had the fleeting thought that I could pull it off that I would be able to stop the car on the right shoulder, but not so. I think the car was still traveling about 60 to 70 miles an hour when I slammed into the sand and the sagebrush, flipping the car over. Eventually, the car came to an abrupt stop with me hanging upside down by my seatbelt. I undid the catch and fell to the floor, which was now the roof of the car. It was impossible to open any of the doors of the car because it had become fairly flattened to the ground. I climbed through a window since all the glass in the vehicle had shattered. Besides a bruised and embarrassed ego, I was completely unharmed. The only cut I had was a small slice of my hand where a piece of glass had stuck me when I released myself from the seatbelt and fell to the ground. After being checked out by the police, who also issued me a ticket, my sweet grandmother, who lived in St. George, somehow let me borrow her car so that I could finish my trip to Las Vegas. I walked into my meeting about 15 minutes late. The hard part was telling my boss, Tom Homo, who was also at the basketball tournament that I had destroyed a university vehicle during my first month on the job. <laughs> to make a bad situation worse, my seat at the basketball game following the meeting happened to be directly in front of President Samuelson. I spent the whole of that game pulling glass out of my hair as inconspicuously as possible. <laughs> in my mind, the timing of that wreck in my life couldn't have been worse. It was life turning one degree colder. I was trying to make a good first impression at my job. My wife and I were doing our best to take care of a sick child, and we had prayed for safety. But the Lord's timing and purpose were made clear over the following days and months. Tom is a great boss, and he's never held the accident and the loss of the car against me. The university eventually replaced the car, but thankfully didn't have to replace me because I was still alive. The Lord had preserved me from what should have been a fatal accident. Having come so close to death helped me more fully appreciate my life and all the people around me. I especially enjoyed the time spent with Caleb late at night when I would wake up to take care of him because not only did it mean I was still alive, but Caleb was too. There were times when I thought that Caleb would live a long time. He had so often battled sicknesses and surgeries, illnesses and infections. He had been to the hospital many times, but always came back to us. We loved having him in our home Caleb could have quickly returned to heaven, but instead brought heaven to us for seven years. Twenty-five days ago, in the timing of the Lord, Caleb slipped peacefully away, being held in the arms of his mother and surrounded by family. He had spent a courageous day fighting with his might against a vicious infection brought on by pneumonia. The wonderful doctors, nurses, and other medical personnel at Primary Children's Medical Center had done all they professionally could to keep Caleb alive, but his body was simply too worn out. I have heroes in my life, Joseph Smith, Captain Moroni, Ammon, and others. On that day, my wife was my hero. She bravely and tenderly leaned down to hug Caleb. 
She whispered in his ear, I love you, Caleb. I am so proud of you. If your body is too tired, it's okay. You can go back. You can return to your heavenly father. For over seven years, her love and God's will had allowed Caleb to be a significant part of our earthly experience. But in the very moment when it was needed, her heart changed. She could let him go. She trusted God because she knew God. She knew that God could understand her personally in a way that few others could. For God had also lost a son. And through the atonement of that son, God can do miracles. He can forgive a sinner. He can save a lost soul. And he can heal a broken heart. With God, nothing is impossible, especially when life is hard and it is 10 degrees colder outside. For all things have been done in the wisdom of him who knoweth all things. God provides the plan and we contribute the faith and courage. We trust in his timing and in his ways to achieve his purposes, even when, and probably especially when, such purposes may be unclear from our perspective. At a state conference not too long ago, I had an interview with a visiting authority. He learned about Caleb as part of our discussion, acknowledging the hard work it took to care for Caleb. I thought he would then encourage me to keep it up and faithfully persevere in the service and sacrifice I was providing. Instead, his next four words entirely transformed my relationship with Caleb. He simply said, you are being exalted. All this time, I thought I and my wife were taking care of Caleb. But in reality, God through Caleb had been taking care of us. God was working a miracle where I hadn't expected. He was performing a miracle on me and on my wife and on our kids and on all those coming in contact with Caleb. Having Caleb in our home was an honor and a privilege. It was also sacred. With faith, courage, hope, and trust, God will bless us no matter how cold our life may feel. I know that God loves us. I know that God hears us and heals us. And I know that he is exalting us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. This BYU devotional address with Dallin Moody was given on March 6, 2012. 